Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do a deep dive on one of my favorite books of all time, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I want to say that up front, this is one of my all-time favorite books because I want you to know I'm not unbiased when it comes to discussing this book. However, there are a lot of interesting conversations and avenues that we could go down and we will go down many of them. Before we begin, I want to just quickly note, I will have a link down below to uh, a post on my blog where I have the text of this conversation and all of the links of my sources and all of that stuff. That will be in the description box down below. I will also have timestamps so you can jump around to different parts of this conversation as you see fit, and I will have links to all of my other Pulitzer Prize videos, a link to my ranking of the Pulitzer Prize books I have read so far, and a discussion of the Great American Novel, because, you know, they kind of go together. All of that stuff will be in the description box down below. And before we begin, I also want to mention that I am wearing my To Kill a Mockingbird t-shirt today for this occasion. Obviously, it just felt thematically correct. It's one of my favorite t-shirts. Big fan of the book, as I said, and it's a fun way of representing the book without really being overt about it. A lot of people have asked me what this shirt is, and when I say it's To Kill a Mockingbird, they don't really get it, so I have to explain. But I love it. I will also show you, very briefly, my editions of To Kill a Mockingbird. So this is the copy that I purchased when I was in high school in the late 1990s. I still have it today, and because I tend to be really careful with books, it's still in really good condition. I also purchased for myself a facsimile of the first edition with this really great author photo that was taken by Truman Capote, who was a childhood friend of Harper Lee's, and I love that. But now let me show you one of my most beloved, probably my most beloved bookish thing that I own, the piece de resistance of my book collection, another edition of To Kill a Mockingbird. And why, you might ask, is this my favorite bookish thing that I own because it's signed by Harper Lee. What? My sister gave this to me for Christmas. Well, it's a long, complicated story. Technically, my father gave it to me for Christmas, but he didn't make the purchases. He didn't decide what the gifts were going to be. So in my heart, the person who gets credit for this is my sister because she knew how much I would love it. And I am going to be super careful of this book. It's not the one that I am going to be holding up. I am going to be very careful of it and lay it out of the way. So I don't, there's nothing I could spill on it, but I just want to be that careful of it. Let's get into the deep dive about To Kill a Mockingbird because this is one of the most beloved books in the world. And while there have been some detractors from the beginning, it has been a beloved American novel since its publication in 1960. It was instantly successful. It won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which is why we're here today. And it quickly spawned a film adaptation that helped secure its legacy as an American institution. It sounds like we're talking about Gone with the Wind again. And there are other similarities in that both books deal with racism in the South. But... To Kill a Mockingbird is decidedly less insidious than Margaret Mitchell's propaganda piece. If you want more about Gone with the Wind, I have a deep dive about it that will be linked down below. In this Pulitzer Prize deep dive, we will look at how To Kill a Mockingbird came to be so well-loved, and we will look into some of the controversies and complaints that people have about it. Just a warning, there will be spoilers for this book. And again, if you'd like to jump around to different parts of the discussion, there will be timestamps in the description box down below. I like to begin these deep dives with a snapshot of what was going on in the world when the book was published. So, although To Kill a Mockingbird won the Pulitzer Prize in 1961, it was published on July 11, 1960. So we're going to look at what was going on in 1960. In bookstores, I had expected To Kill a Mockingbird to appear on Publishers Weekly's list of best-selling books for the year, but it didn't actually appear on that list until 1961. Instead, the best-selling book of 1960 was the book that won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction that year, Advise and Consent, which had been published in 1959. Again, the Pulitzer Prize is awarded the year after 
publication. So that's why a 1959 book won a Pulitzer Prize in 1960. Advise and Consent was followed by a previous Pulitzer Prize winner, James A. Michener, but this time for his book Hawaii. The Nobel Prize for Literature was awarded to French author St. John Perse for the soaring flight and the evocative imagery of his poetry, which in a visionary fashion reflects the conditions of our time. Philip Roth won the 1916 National Book Award for Fiction, but in those days, the National Book Award operated on a system like the Pulitzer, where it was awarded after the eligibility year. So 1960 novels competed in 1961, where Harper Lee lost to a former Pulitzer Prize winner named Conrad Richter for his novel, The Waters of Kronos. In the movies, you can see the vast systemic changes that Hollywood would undergo in the 1960s already at play at the box office, where Spartacus reigned supreme but was followed by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Ben-Hur won Best Picture at the Academy Awards, which again celebrated films released in 1959. The Apartment is the movie that would go on to win the prize the following year. A lot happened in the news, so this is a very big distillation of everything. But in the news, the Greensboro sit-ins, where four black students attempted to be served at a Woolworths lunch counter in, you guessed it, Greensboro, North Carolina, took place on February 1st, triggering similar nonviolent protests across the South. In March, the United States announced that 3,500 soldiers would be sent to Vietnam. The new and current American flag was flown for the first time on July 4th, Hawaii had become the 50th state in 1959. And on November 8th, John F. Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon to become president of the United States. Kennedy and Nixon had participated in the first televised presidential debate in September. Now, let's talk about To Kill a Mockingbird. And the first thing we should talk about is what this book is about. You probably already know, but just in case, To Kill a Mockingbird is a coming-of-age story told from the perspective of Jean Louise Finch, a tomboy who goes by the nickname Scout as she grows up during the Great Depression in the town of Macomb, Alabama. The first section of the book is largely plotless, as we get to know six-year-old Scout, her brother Jem, their father Atticus, Scout and Jem's friend Dill, and the citizens of Macomb. What storyline there is in this section follows an obsession the kids have with the Finch's reclusive neighbor, Arthur Boo Radley. Boo Radley is the subject of a great deal of local lore. He's sort of like a boogeyman for the local children. And the children in Maycomb balance a terrible fear of him with this intense curiosity as they continue to spin urban legends about why he hides away from the world and what he might do if he were to come out into the world. We follow the kids along three summers as they learn life lessons and begin the journey toward growing up. The book's second section finds Scout's father, Atticus, assigned to defend a black man named Tom Robinson, who has been accused of raping a white woman. Things get dark when a large segment of the town turns on Atticus, who insists that Robinson get as close to a fair trial as possible. And it keeps getting darker, but somehow the book never loses an overall warm and friendly feeling, probably because we are firmly situated in the perspective of a child. This book also has one of my all-time favorite endings to a book ever, when Scout stands on the Radley porch and sees the neighborhood through a new point of view, replaying the activities of her youth over again in her mind, I just think it's really beautiful, and I think it's a perfect encapsulation of the journey that she has gone on in the book and the new understanding that she has at the end. It probably is actually my favorite resolution to a book. I just love it that much. Let's talk about why this book won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and I'll hold up this one for that one discussion. The first reason I think this won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction is economics. To Kill a Mockingbird was a successful book that was well-received by both critics and audiences. The second reason is that it got over the hump of Harper Lee being a debut author when the Pulitzer jury found that some of the more experienced competition had some well-intentioned misfires, and we'll discuss that a little bit later on when we talk about the direct competition of To Kill a Mockingbird to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The third reason is that To Kill a Mockingbird ticks a lot of boxes for the Pulitzer Board in the first 50 years of its existence. It loved books about race, like Scarlet Sister Mary. It loved books about the South, like 
Shudder, Gone with the Wind. The Great Depression is also represented, so are coming-of-age novels. The Pulitzer Board was also fascinated with novels that reflect the changing tides of American society. And The Way to Kill a Mockingbird perfectly captures Depression-era nostalgia with the context of the burgeoning civil rights movement had to feel like catnip to the Pulitzer Board. I think that's probably what really gave it an edge more than anything else. Now let's talk about why To Kill a Mockingbird is so beloved. And believe me, this book is loved. Americans named it The Great American Read during a PBS series that aimed to find America's best loved novel. Interestingly, it didn't have to be an American novel. It just so happens that the book that won is not only American, but is sort of quintessentially American. In announcing the results, PBS noted that To Kill a Mockingbird had, quote, kept the lead for the entire five months of voting despite strong competition from the rest of our five finalists. It also topped the list of votes in every state except North Carolina, who went for Outlander, and Wyoming, who preferred Lord of the Rings. Such widespread support from readers across the country make To Kill a Mockingbird a worthy winner of the great American read." End quote. Even British librarians declared that To Kill a Mockingbird is the book every adult should read before they die. It beat the Bible. That really says something. Still, this is a tricky question to answer. Something doesn't become a cultural institution overnight. It happens over time, which is why it's so incredibly rare and difficult to predict. Even when a book isn't initially successful, it can still become a classic. The Great Gatsby, for example. But To Kill a Mockingbird isn't just a classic. It's ubiquitous in discussions of great literature. I think the first stepping stone is the film adaptation, released just two years after the book. It's the same foundation that helped Gone with the Wind become more than just a best-selling book. And the film adaptation of Gone with the Wind also came out just two years after the book was released to big commercial success. And while Gone with the Wind has um, problems, To Kill a Mockingbird is a lot more wholesome, even though it also has detractors and has from the moment it was published. But it's not just that these two books had film adaptations. Lots of movies have film adaptations. These books have iconic film adaptations. They are widely seen, widely loved, and that adoration has sustained for generations. That ties into the next stepping stone, which I think is the educational component. Because if your school was anything like the ones that I went to, you usually watched the movie after finishing the book. And although To Kill a Mockingbird has been a target for book banners from day one, it has still consistently been taught in American schools. That is probably why studies have shown that this is the most widely read book in the United States. Even people who don't read as a hobby are still likely to have read it because it was assigned to them in school. I moved around a fair amount during my school years, so the books that I read in school tend to wildly differ from other people. But no matter where I lived, people had read To Kill a Mockingbird in a class at some point. And just to hammer that in, I'll tell you, the first time I read To Kill a Mockingbird was in my ninth grade English class. The second time I read it was in a civics class in my senior year of high school. So not only did I learn about it in an English class, I also learned about it in a civics class. And I think that goes to the breadth of discussion that you can have in this book and how it is used in educational settings. But ultimately, movies don't make people remember books and reading something in school does not mean that you will love it forever. There must be something in the book that speaks to people generation after generation. I think a massive part of that appeal is that To Kill a Mockingbird covers many complex, thorny, and unpleasant topics, but still somehow manages to feel comforting. As I said earlier, I think a lot of that comes down to the genius way Harper Lee inhabits a child's perspective. When you read, say, Beloved, it can feel like an unrelenting assault, which kind of is the point of Beloved. The unpleasantness here is filtered. Scout is only beginning to understand it. I also think nostalgia has a universal appeal. 
Even if you didn't grow up in the Depression, and even if you aren't entirely done growing up when you read this book for the first time, Scout's experience of growing up is relatable to a large portion of the population. We all tend to look back at our childhood, even if childhood wasn't that long ago for the reader. It's why nostalgia trends keep happening. It's why all of the popular movies from the 70s, 80s, and now 90s keep getting revisited with sequels, reboots, and requels. To Kill a Mockingbird taps into that sense of nostalgia for the past. It's also a book with many lessons to teach you without making you feel like you're eating your vegetables. The notion of walking a mile in someone else's shoes, I still try to live that lesson. And I read this book for the first time when I was in ninth grade. I'm 41 years old now. Whatever the reason, I think there's every reason to believe that To Kill a Mockingbird will continue to be beloved well into the future. Now let's talk about who Harper Lee is. And I'm going to turn the book around so you can see this really cool photo that was taken of her by Truman Capote. Nell Harper Lee was born in Monroeville, Alabama on April 28, 1926. She was named after her grandmother, Ellen, but her parents spelled her name backward, which is why there's an E at the end of Nell in her name. Although she was known as Nell among friends, she decided to use her middle name as her pen name because she was worried that people would mistake her name for Nellie. She attended college, but left one semester short of finishing her degree. She moved to New York City in 1949 and worked in a bookstore and as an airline reservation agent while writing in her spare time. She found an agent in 1956, and the same year, friends gave her a year's wages as a Christmas gift so she could take time off to focus on her writing. The result was To Kill a Mockingbird. Imagine where we would be without those incredibly generous friends of hers. Lee drew on her childhood and family for inspiration for To Kill a Mockingbird. Like Scout, Lee was the daughter of an attorney who later signed autographs as Atticus Finch. Her mother's maiden name was Finch. And the character of Dill is based on Lee's childhood friend, Truman Capote. And yes, just so we're clear, we are talking about that Truman Capote, the same one who took this photo of her. Harper Lee tended to downplay the autobiographical details in the novel, but Capote indicated that there had also been a real-life recluse on the street who helped inspire the character of Boo Radley. The success of To Kill a Mockingbird surprised Harper Lee and created a great sense of pressure for her, which is another parallel to Gone with the Wind and its author, Margaret Mitchell, who was so unsure how to follow up Gone with the Wind that she never published another book before she died in a car accident. Harper Lee was also press shy and tended to avoid interviews or public appearances. Ultimately, she never published another book. I don't count Go Set a Watchman, and there will be more on that later. She had worked on a novel, but never finished it. But if you've ever seen the movie Capote, you do know that Harper Lee helped Truman Capote research his book in Cold Blood. Some people believe a conspiracy theory that Harper Lee never actually wrote another novel because Truman Capote had helped her with To Kill a Mockingbird, and that this is why a debut novelist was able to write such a superlative book. There are a lot of variations on that idea out there. I don't believe them. If you want an overview of Harper Lee's life after To Kill a Mockingbird and why she never published again, I recommend Casey Sepp's Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee. The first half of this book is a true crime story that I thought was just okay, but the second half of the book follows Harper Lee as she researches the crime to shape an idea for a novel that ultimately never comes to fruition. Let's talk about whether or not To Kill a Mockingbird is problematic. Ultimately, it depends on your perspective. Historically, To Kill a Mockingbird has been understood to be about compassion, understanding, and racial equality. It does have a lot of uses of the N-word, but I think this is a case where the argument that you should take into account when a book was written and when the book is set really does come into play. Scout is a child growing up in Alabama during the Great Depression. She doesn't understand that the N-word could be offensive. Over the course of the book, she gets some lessons about it being a word that she should not use, but the argument 
is that it makes her sound common, not that it's demeaning. That does reflect the time, and the word is so commonly used around Scout that she just sees it as a descriptive term. However, some people have dismissed To Kill a Mockingbird as just another white savior narrative in recent years. In other words, a story where a white person acts heroically on behalf of people of color. Specifically in this case, the idea is that white people can feel better about racism and inequality because Atticus stands up for Tom Robinson. I don't think the lesson in this book is that Atticus is a white savior figure. I think the lesson is how scary it is that it would have been so easy for Atticus to do nothing. It would have been easy for him to stand aside and let Tom Robinson go to death row. On top of that, it's horrifying that the injustice of what happens to Tom Robinson is so separated from the white citizens of Maycomb that they could just go about their lives without being bothered by it at all if they chose to live that way. Harper Lee is condemning the type of complacency that allows that to be the way the world works. And someone is surely justified in reading this and thinking that a white person could read this and hide behind the good things that Atticus does. But at the same time, the other white people in the book are either overly complacent or complicit. And that's happening too. On that note, I think Harper Lee is also subtly condemning the way most white citizens in the town are perfectly happy to stand aside and let Atticus fight alone for the soul of the town. Even people who agree with Atticus don't speak out about it or push back at all. There's a passivity among the white population of Maycomb that allows change to move at a glacial pace if it moves at all. Harper Lee is also making it clear that what happens to Tom Robinson is a tragedy, and the blame for that tragedy is entirely on the white citizens of Maycomb, because it's obvious that Tom Robinson is innocent. The fact that he is arrested, put on trial, and convicted is treated as deplorable, or understood to be deplorable, by the novel, and it only happens because the white people of Maycomb allow it to happen. You cannot read this book and come away without thinking that this is a tragedy. To me, that negates the white savior aspect. Part of the genius of To Kill a Mockingbird is that its coming-of-age structure allows Harper Lee to explore how racism is taught and enforced. She also treats it as a tragedy that Scout, Dill, and Jem may grow up not to see the injustice of racism around them. Without the influence of someone like Atticus, they may eventually accept it as the way of the world. During Tom Robinson's trial, Scout has to take Dill outside because he starts crying about the injustice of what is happening. There, they are comforted by Dolphus Raymond. There's a lot I could say about the character of Dolphus, but for time, I will just focus on what he says to Scout and Dill, on this subject. Here is a long quote from the book. Because you're children and you can understand it, he said, and because I heard that one, he jerked his head at Dill, things haven't caught up with that one's instinct yet. Let him get a little older and he won't get sick and cry. Maybe things will strike him as being not quite right, say, but he won't cry, not when he gets a few years on him. Cry about what, Mr. Raymond? Dill's maleness was beginning to assert itself. Cry about the simple hell people give other people, without even thinking. Cry about the hell white people give colored folks, without even stopping to think that they're people too. Atticus says cheating a colored man is ten times worse than cheating a white man, I muttered. Says it's the worst thing you could do. Mr. Raymond said, I don't reckon it's... Miss Jean Louise, you don't know your pa's not a run-of-the-mill man. It'll take a few years for that to sink in. You haven't seen enough of the world yet. You haven't even seen this town. But all you got to do is step back inside the courthouse, end quote. So from one perspective, To Kill a Mockingbird is about an exceptional white man standing up against racism. But that's not the whole story. To call this a white savior story is to ignore the way Harper Lee is aware of how Atticus is exceptional. And she frames the story to amplify the tragedy that more white people are not like him. Another way in which To Kill a Mockingbird is much more complex in its approach to race than it may appear on the surface is how Scout, 
grows to a deeper understanding of Calpurnia, their maid and cook. For the book's first half, Calpurnia only exists in a functional role for Scout. But when Calpurnia takes Scout and Jem to her church one Sunday morning, it forces Scout to see that there's much more to Calpurnia. Quote, that Calpurnia led a modest double life never dawned on me. The idea that she had a separate existence outside of our household was a novel one, to say nothing of her having command of two languages. End quote. And because Scout is too young to realize that Maycomb society would, would rather keep the races separate, on the following page, she asks Calpurnia if she can come to her house sometime so she can get to know her on her own terms. She wants to get to know Cal as a person, but for the rest of the novel, her aunt prevents her from seeing this through. Again, tying back to the idea that racism and segregation are instilled and supported over time by people learning to enforce them. I have seen Calpurnia referred to as a mammy type, but I think this does a disservice to the complexity of Scout's relationship with her. She's a mother figure and a servant, a friend and a foe, all depending on Scout's emotion at that moment and whether or not Cal is chastising Scout for poor behavior. She's also someone who has a life outside of the Finch home. And I've seen some people criticize To Kill a Mockingbird for getting its audience to sympathize with Tom Robinson by making him a saintly character. The subtle implication is that people of color should be exceptional in order to be allowed rights. But I think the way there are various reactions when Calpurnia takes Jem and Scout to her church is a subtle nod to the idea that the black citizens of Maycomb are just as variable as the white people we spend a lot more time with in the novel. And at the end of the day, if Tom Robinson does appear saintly, this was not an uncommon storytelling trope in the 1960s. Sidney Poitier became one of the most popular actors of the decade and became the first black man to win an Oscar for Best Actor. But still, by the 1970s, his career languished due to criticism that he only portrayed upstanding saintly men. Furthermore, something that struck me on my recent reread of this book is that many people, myself included, Assume the metaphorical mockingbird of the title only refers to Scout's neighbor, Boo Radley. If you're unfamiliar, the title comes from how when Scout and Jem are gifted air rifles for Christmas, Atticus tells them that it's a sin to kill a mockingbird because mockingbirds don't do anything to anybody. They just sing, and that's all. That's why at the end of the book, Sheriff Tate protects Boo Radley by declaring that Bob Ewell fell on his knife, and that's it. But Tom Robinson is deliberately also framed as a mockingbird. It's just that in his case, no one protects him or can protect him from harm. So if Tom Robinson appears saintly, maybe it's because he's also an extension of the book's central metaphor. Is To Kill a Mockingbird perfect on race? No. But I do think it's remarkably forward-thinking and complex for its time. I also think it has good intentions, which is more than you can say about many books from its era and earlier, and books that were published later as well. Are there adaptations or sequels to To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, the 1962 film adaptation is a classic in its own right, and many people cite Gregory Peck's Academy Award-winning turn as Atticus as one of the greatest movie performances of all time. Aaron Sorkin also adapted the novel into a play that hit Broadway in 2018. The question of sequels is a bit thornier. Ghost Set a Watchman was published in 2015 by HarperCollins. It was initially promoted as a sequel, but the truth is that it was actually a first draft of To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper Lee's editor, Tay Hohoff, thought that the first draft or initial draft of To Kill a Mockingbird showed promise, but she thought the best part of the book was a flashback to Scout's childhood. So the novel was rewritten completely retitled Atticus, and then retitled again to be To Kill a Mockingbird because Harper Lee didn't want to put so much emphasis on a single character. The focus of the story, the nature of certain characters, and more altered as they went through drafts and finalized the book, which is what was actually published. 
So it's bizarre that HarperCollins initially announced Ghost at a Watchmen as a sequel. It's not. Then came the controversy around how Ghost at a Watchmen came to be published in the first place. HarperCollins claims that the manuscript was found in 2011 during an appraisal of Harper Lee's assets and that Harper Lee herself cooperated with and was enthusiastic about the publication of this novel after so many years. However, that version of events relies on the notion that Ghost at a Watchman is a separate novel that was intended for publication, and that just isn't the case. It also flies in the face of statements that Harper Lee made over the years that she had never written another novel. Furthermore, the timing of the publication feels bizarre. The announcement came not long after Harper Lee's sister and caregiver, Alice, passed away. There have been accusations that the publisher exploited the absence of a caregiver to get permission to publish what was actually an early draft of an already published book. There have been people, including Harper Lee's friend, former neighbor, and biographer, Marja Mills, who stated that Harper Lee was incapable of giving consent at her age and in her condition. There have been others who claim she was capable of consent. Long story short, it's a mess. Regardless of what the truth of the situation is, I don't like the look or the feel of Ghost at a Watchman or how it ended up in bookstores, so I will not read it. If you want to educate yourself about it, I would encourage you to Google Go Set a Watchman, go to the Wikipedia page, explore what it says, and go through the sources that it cites, and you can make up your own decision about whether or not it's something that you would like to read. Is To Kill a Mockingbird the Great American Novel? If you follow along with my channel or with my Pulitzer series, either one, you know that I have made the concept of the Great American Novel a part of my Pulitzer Prize project. That's because I think the Pulitzer Prize, at least as it was originally conceived, goes hand in hand with the notion of the great American novel, essentially a mythic quest created to legitimize American art on the world stage. In my longer post about the great American novel, which will be down below, I conclude that no one book can sum up all of the things that America is. I recommend that you really have to have a short list of books to even approach encompassing all of those things. But if you told me you have to pick one book, To Kill a Mockingbird does manage to cover a lot of those bases. It would be my pick for that role. Because in addition to covering the Great Depression and childhood and race, it also really covers class and classism and gender roles and expectations a lot in its pages. And, you know, for timing purposes, we really can't cover a lot of those other things, but you could certainly read this book and focus on just the class issues and you would come away with a lot of information and have a lot of really interesting things to say. So if you told me you can only pick one book to represent American literature, I would pick To Kill a Mockingbird. However, I don't think that one book can encompass all of America in itself. It's just the way I think. Let's talk about what To Kill a Mockingbird's competition for the Pulitzer Prize was. The other finalist that year was The Child Buyer by John Hersey, who had already won a Pulitzer in 1945 for A Bell for Adano. The jury recommended that the prize go to Harper Lee, and the Pulitzer board agreed. In those days, the jury was required to submit a report to the Pulitzer board along with their recommendation. That report mentioned two powerhouse novelists who did go on to win their own Pulitzer Prizes, William Styron and John Updike. In the case of John Updike, he actually went on to win two Pulitzer Prizes for fiction. But according to John Hohenberg's book, The Pulitzer Prizes, John Hohenberg was an administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes for many years. Uh, and in, in his book, he says that the report that the jurors wrote dismissed both William Styron's Set This House on Fire and John Updike's Rabbit Run, noting that the authors had, quote, both lavished major talents on minor themes, end quote. That's as close to a burn as you can get in academia. It's a pretty solid burn, actually. And having read and despised Rabbit Run, 
I can only say that I'm glad it was dismissed so handily by the Pulitzer jury. Let's get to the big question we have here. Should To Kill a Mockingbird have won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction? Well, in case you can't tell, let me make it very clear. I absolutely think To Kill a Mockingbird deserved to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. I also think it is one of the best Pulitzer Prize winners. Furthermore, I think it's one of the best American novels. It's certainly one of my favorite books of all time. Again, I talked about this book for... I, I did a preliminary ranking of the Pulitzer books that I've read so far. You can guess this one did well. It will be one of the videos that is linked down below. So I absolutely think this deserved to win. I think it would be really upsetting to look at the list of Pulitzer books and not see this on it. I also don't see any book that was published the same year that you could make a compelling argument for. Rabbit Run would really be the only one. And again, I hated that book. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. So To Kill a Mockingbird has a pretty unassailable place in the canon of Pulitzer Prize for fiction winners. In my opinion, I would love to hear what you think of To Kill a Mockingbird. I'd love to hear if you love it, if you hate it, if you're just middling about it. I'd love to hear what you think about why it is such a beloved book around the world. I'd love to hear if you think it's problematic or if there are aspects of it that haven't aged well. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. I will be back very soon with a Pulitzer Prize deep dive on Interpreter of Maladies. I have just finished that book yesterday, so I am already working on that post as well. So stay tuned for that. And again, there will be a lot more down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.